morning, everybody. And thank you, Robert and Jason, for uh, having me here. Great uh, setup for uh, the things I hope to talk about today. Um, I was going to go blank on that a sec. You know, growing up uh, in a, my, my grandparents came over from Japan, turn of the century, 1906, 1904. Um, and growing up in a, an immigrant farming family, uh, the other day we were trying to think about, I was thinking about all the different things that I've had a chance to eat in my life. And part of being a, a part of an immigrant family, part of the fact that we're in agriculture, part of the fact that we're in California, and started to go through all the different lists of things. And so, you know, you start with seaweed, you start with uh, algae, and some of these things don't make much sense, but algae, snails, um, snakes, uh, I've had um, um, everything from, let me go through the list here. Corn smut, forest morals, uh, peyote, oh, that doesn't count, does it? Um, <laughs> alligator, uh, sea slug, sea urchin, jellyfish, uh, octopus, squid, eels, crickets, worms, uh, ant eggs, really delicious, bamboo shoots, lotus root, cactus, pigeon, emu, ostrich. You know, the, the idea here is the things I haven't eaten is uh, grubs. I haven't had dog, cat, monkey, horse, squirrel, uh, bat, whale. Um, big game animals. Um, the, the point of that is if we were in a hunting gathering society, a lot of these uh, things that I just mentioned would still be uh, staples or delicacies or things that would be on the table. But because of agriculture, which is again 10, 15, 25,000, we don't quite know because we don't have the records of it, how long it's been going on. Agriculture changes diets, it's changed the way we've looked at things. And uh, while there are a lot of critics uh, who say the food system is broken, uh, I, uh, as a farmer, I would say I would uh, respectfully disagree. Uh, I think it's been an amazing uh, time for us to have systems that put more abundance, more consistently, with more choices on the table than really uh, anything else uh, we've ever seen in the history of mankind. And you know this, all of you, because you go down and seasonally, uh, regionally, you can find anything you want, even those uh, hunting gathering kind of products that I just mentioned, they're made available in a society that has structure to bring them on. Um, I think our challenge uh, with having so much abundance, and that's I think continues to be the, the issue, I, is that there's a, a tendency to have preferences without remembering how did we get the product there in the first place, and this hard uh, uh, challenge, especially as we move forward with making sure we can make and get and produce food products and predictably get them onto a plate. Those are the things that I think that are ahead of us that we have to really worry about. And um, Jason mentioned it's just really uh, in the last hundred, a hundred years ago, 40% of the American public earned a living with agriculture. That's just a hundred years ago. And during that same time frame, you know, you would all know that. Um, Many, many families, the majority of families in the nation had gardens, they raised livestock and they were, uh, did that to get through two world wars and a depression. Uh, they also did that because, interestingly, we were also in a society uh, 50, 60 years ago, let's say, let's say 70 years ago, that was still dependent on horsepower for a lot of things. Um, my grandfather, turn of the century, one of his first businesses that he had was bringing hay from Orange County up here to Los Angeles for the horse and buggy trade. And uh, we used to laugh because he was saying, you know, we were saying he's in the fuel transportation business actually at that point. But um, it wasn't that long ago then that these were the kinds of issues. And when you have horses or cattle, uh, you have to grow something to feed them. And so fuel for food has never been really that big a stretch if you really think about it. It was just recently when we ha got mechanized that we could move into this other arena of leaving that behind. Um, Currently, we spend a tremendous amount of money back, for example, in production and food for our pets. And that's kind of taken a little bit of, uh, of a change other than what we would have done on our own farms and our own ranches, feeding our own animals, including our pets. Uh, but the enormous industry, that's the pet food industry, is something that drives a lot of food production. Um, but somewhere between then, that generation of our parents, our grandparents, and where we are today, there is a disconnect, uh, something that's broken. I, I can see it. You can talk to young kids, you can talk to young teenagers, you can talk to young adults, and they just don't grasp how tough it is to actually uh, get food out. This guy on the left here, that's actually, I call him my Uncle John, but he's uh, 
uh, just died a few years ago, but he's the man that taught me how to farm. And it's just, there are so many uh, seniors that are alive today that remember uh, hooking up the horse and actually basically still producing the food supply that we know today. Um, we talked about how far back this goes, whether it's the Mesopotamians up to the Mayans, up to the present day, and it wasn't that long ago when you had a food collapse, when you had a collapse in your food supply because of a disease outbreak or horrible weather, it wasn't that long ago when civilizations would say, oh, the gods are mad, we better sacrifice some prized animal or some lovely maiden or, you know, or something like that. And we recognize that what's happened now is that same challenge of having enough to eat, having more than we need to eat, is that that stark reality of scarcity which our parents and our grandparents have gone through, that's what drove them to understand that, and I say this regularly now, that food is a privilege, it's not a right. It's not some right that the government can grant and say, here, we're gonna make sure you all have food because they can't promise, no more than I can promise, that I can produce it in my fields. I lost a couple crops this last year uh, by very simple things. We, uh, we had no rain, the only green product in the late spring and down here in Southern California, there was no grass cover because of the lack of rain. I had a cabbage field, it was the only thing green for you know, half a mile around. And every aphid known to man decided that it wanted to eat my uh, certified organic cabbage. And uh, we lost uh, that field after we struggled to try and save it, but we didn't want to lose our organic certification. So we eventually we walked away from it. One of the first times in the history of mankind that I think you see uh, civilizations where we're walking away from perfectly good food, whether it's for cosmetic reasons, whether it's for a lack of a tool that you could use but you don't want to lose your certification. These are some of the challenges we're looking at or some of the really odd kind of circumstances we find ourselves in when you have a system of abundance. And the system of abundance is a great thing to have because what's the opposite of that? It's a system of scarcity. So knowing that and understanding that these different kinds of challenges uh, to former generations where they understood what happens when you lose a crop to a flood or to a pest or to a, a drought or extreme heat. They understood it because it was taking place in their yards, in their fields. They could understand that and it wasn't that kind of a challenge for them to look at the incoming threats of diseases, of climate change, of unknown um, embargoes, uh, quarantines. And we started to recognize that they could put together uh, the strategies for how you move forward. I put this slide up here mostly because it represents a lot. Uh, people talk about the Green Revolution. Green Revolution is a description of this transition into really a, a high-powered, very productive kind of agriculture. But the seeds of that, the starting part of that, comes back into a very simple, amazing group of scientists that in the early 30s could see that, uh, for example, and this is Norman Borlaug and many of his associates, it was only in the 30s that these scientists started to realize because there was enough knowledge and science developing so they could understand these things that a huge dust storm in Africa would pick up a tremendous amount of soil, pull it up into the atmosphere, put it up in the jet stream, and in that dirt and soil that was in the, uh, that was in the atmosphere, you'd find spores, fungal spores of pathogens like wheat rust and blight, and they would go up in the jet stream and they would dump on Asia, on Europe, on North America, and you'd be sitting there, these civilizations would be sitting there, and all of a sudden those crops would collapse. They'd have a catastrophic collapse because of a disease outbreak. And people would go, oh my God, the gods must be mad. But this group in the 1930s started to realize that that's what was going on, that that's what was happening, and that these threats that we still have today, nothing's changed, to our ability to survive are still ongoing, and it's only with science and technology that you start to realize, and some wisdom uh, from the past, that these are the things that we better look forward to, try to prevent, try to adapt to, and more importantly, see if we can find solution sets to help head them off. That group of scientists was working enormously hard to find disease-resistant and other characteristics in old-fashioned breeding to create strains of wheat that could actually head off a very predictable famine. And that predictable famine would have taken out millions of people, and that's why Norman Borlaug got a Nobel Peace Prize. It's not about the Green Revolution. It's about really heroic things that took place 
in the world of a breeder that dedicated his life to changing the course of mankind in many ways. And it's hard to accept the people that throw rocks and stones and say how horrible the Green Revolution is or how tough it is to be looking at breeding right now. I'm not going to get into the different kinds of breeding that are out there, but these are all the tools that we have in our hand then to work with at a time when there's a lot of challenges facing us. Now, whether it's a jet stream, whether it's a jet plane that carries a guy with an Ebola virus or any other, uh, many of you knew about uh, avian influenza, and the fear of pandemic was, for me, when I was in Sacramento, was one of those big eye-openers that you said, you know, holy, holy shit, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of challenges here. And the world is not less vulnerable than it was 100 years ago, 10,000 years ago. It's as vulnerable as it's ever been. It's more complex than it's ever been. And these are the kinds of challenges, I think, then that continue to play out that we have to be thankful that we're looking at this convergence, confluence, this... Uh, accumulation of knowledge. It was a hundred years ago. How many of you guys had a chance to celebrate Cooperative Extension 100 year uh, birthday this year? Any Cooperative Extension people out there? You're my heroes because I learned how to farm. I'm not, I don't have a science background. I don't have an agronomy background. I was a literature major, which doesn't get me far um, <laughs> in a farming field. But you had to ask a lot of questions. And what's amazing about Cooperative Extension is 100 years ago, by the stroke of a pen, and it's part of also what happened with the land-grant colleges, you had a president that said, and, and the Congress, because it, it was not an easy piece of legislation, but they're the ones that said, for the first time in the history of mankind, we're going to actually make access to knowledge a right. And you don't have to come from some elite background. You can be a citizen in this country, and you're going to have access to education. Now, of course, maybe women weren't, women weren't allowed in, this, in some of those colleges at the time, but the important fact was that was an enormous, enormously important change for the way the world is today. And the Cooperative Extension, which came 50 years later after the land grant, that made that knowledge accessible then to the common citizen in the form of knowledge that you can use and experience and the, the, the extension, if you will, the sharing of the knowledge and how do you put it into play. And so we recognize that we're living at a time and we're starting to see the results and benefits of a global society that allows you uh, to share all the accumulated knowledge on the planet. And we are, oops, I'm sorry. And we are excited about this. But what's happening right now is we have the capacity for the first time in human history over these last decades, I'd say, to actually feed everybody on the planet a healthy diet, pull them out of the uh, lives of scarcity or lives of, of survival, and put them actually into a living path. We have that capacity. We have the ability. We have all the logistical uh, tools to do it. But governments and not so civil societies are, are keeping that from happening. Uh, let's hope that maybe we might get our act together. But here's the challenge. As you increase from 7 billion people to 9 billion people, uh, those of us who are working in these areas a lot are saying, Do we, will we continue to have the capacity, the ability to feed all these people, given the kind of challenges that are out there and given the kinds of things that are coming down the pipeline? Um, the answer to that is to say that, well, you can believe it's a, a challenge where we're, where we're looking at a glass half empty, or the opposite, you're looking at a glass that's half full that has tremendous potential. And that's where I'd like to talk a lot about that today, is where we, we're really believing that the, the task ahead of us right now is not something without solutions. Um, our project called Solutions from the Land is just that. We're trying to look by the region, by the area, by the commodity groups, but more importantly, in a watershed, food shed, energy shed, vision of trying to look at how all the different components of, that go into food production and life system management can be brought together. Um, a good example of what's exciting right now is just uh, how many of you uh, are all from Southern California, right? Just in September, you remember seeing the huge giant waves offshore that were battering some of the piers and uh, if you were out in the desert they had some flash floods. That was three close near-miss hurricanes that uh, uh, came into our area. Um, in the month of September. My neighbor down here, I farm off the, uh, down in Seal Beach. My neighbor is, uh, it was neat because it was Veterans Day yesterday. He's a 
a retired colonel, but he's also one of the famous legendary lima bean growers of the area. And he's 89 years old, still alive and still farming, still gets up on a tractor and drives around. He was telling me in September as that first storm came through, he goes, oh yeah, I remember, I was 14 years old. He's born 1925. It was 1939 uh, and a huge hurricane showed up in California, in Southern California uh, on a Sunday on, uh, in 1939. He had just finished, his family had just finished harvesting. They were kind of done for the season with the dry beans that they had. He says he remembers walking outside, putting his hand out, and there had been no clouds there early in the day. At, at nighttime, a big old raindrop hits it. He says that night, six inches of rain fell. Now, Orange County and LA County at the time were the breadbasket of the country, and most of it went underwater in that storm. There was no warning. There was no satellite information. There was, of course, no TV. And well, here's my point. Today, whether it's me on a phone, whether this uh, farmer in Rwanda is on, on their smartphone, you can track your approaching sandstorm or dust storm or hurricane, and you make decisions right now, right today, to help avert some of the crisis that might hit your farm. And these are the things, the tools we have, and uh, actually that's what I think is important right now, is we want a toolbox, a robust, dynamic toolbox, anywhere we go, whether it's urban farming, whether it's rural farming, whether it's anywhere on the planet, we need to make that box dynamic, robust, and ready for what's coming up ahead of us. And those of us that are farmers are excited about doing that because there's a lot of neat things happening. Um, the many challenges then that we have in trying to work with governments, work with the regulatory agencies, working with the public, with everybody with their preferences, with everybody with their ideas of what food production is all about, we recognize, I think, we have to get some more uh, commonality and understanding. And that's kind of why I, today I'm talking, starting from the Mayans or the Mesopotamians and coming up to where we are today because we're moving at an accelerated rate, accelerated rate into this future. And people have then a lot of notions about how they're going to feed the planet my contention on that is that um, we'll need every system that we have doing extremely well in the future to give us these different choices and different kinds of abundance. Um, on my own farm right now, there's just every day different things are happening, uh, whether it's a new tractor, new satellite technology, drones are out there. I haven't gotten one yet. I see how they, what they can do. They can pinpoint in your field places, that uh, parts that are not doing well that you can't see from the ground maybe. Although if you're walking your fields, you should be able to see those things. Um, you're seeing uh, new varieties show up. You're seeing new ways of combating or, or, or attacking pests or living with pests. I'm both an organic, certified organic grower and a conventional grower. We started shifting into, I would say, organic principles and especially paying attention to the soil uh, in the 80s. We started, we, 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 had, we started out farming on a lot of really tough, sterile, beaten up land and we saw that we could uh, revive that soil and make it a lot more fertile. Our challenge is we don't own any of the ground that we farm on, so it's a limited as far as how much I can invest on any year in building that soil back up. But I will tell you that soil is an amazingly resilient uh, part of the infrastructure of agriculture, and there's a lot of neat things we can do with it. Uh, in looking at the challenges on farm, uh, I wanted to just make this one important point with this, with this uh, audience today, with all of you today, is we're going to talk about all the amazing different kinds of systems that are out there that are new, that are exciting, that are uh, emerging, that are places where we can grow uh, enormous amounts of food and quantities of food, but let's not think that that's the replacement for the enormous amount of acreage around the planet, whether it's in Africa, whether it's the United States, whether it's in India, wherever it's going to be that we need to continue to produce the tonnage, the calories, the kind of food that does feed a planet. So uh, as, as I go forward, a lot of people like to think that, oh, I got all the food I need off the rooftop over here. Um, that rooftop, you know. But what happens is uh, we can produce a tremendous amount of nutrient-dense nutrient food in a lot of neat places. We're producing things in buildings. Uh, I see uh, urban, where are you guys? Urban produce is here. There's, great production going on in terms of hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics. Um, we're seeing uh, 
outside, inside, uh, under, underwater, in deserts, places that you didn't think you can farm. That's what's exciting. There's neat things happening uh, in terms of how we produce food. Uh, I always say you can thank, and we have to thank the American marijuana growers for the great job they've done, right, in <laughs> developing closed system, uh, uh, highly efficient uh, production systems. And you don't get that without also the development of great digital equipment that helps you to do the management at precise numbers with precise uh, nutrient blends. And, uh, and this idea of controlled environment, controlling your output uh, with your input. Um, those of us who are farmers will always invest in something that gives us a higher predictability of our outcome. You know, you know what I mean? If I can see that I can invest in a new water system, I can invest in new seeds, I can invest in a new tracking system, any of those things that give me better results, more predictable results in agriculture, those are important things for us. And now you see this nice merging together then of Silicon Valley with the tech people, with the um, different areas of agriculture, all the way from wellness to just simple in the field production. And that's really exciting for us because that means you have a new wave of thinking, a new wave of, uh, of energy, I guess, if you will, and innovation and creative thought coming into our arena. So with these amazing things that are happening every day, I do want to say that there is one thing that's really important as well. Um, and that is that as much as we think um, systems like aquaponics uh, are great because you can put those in your garage, you can, uh, you know, you have the fish, bring it right to your food, uh, right for it to your own table uh, and make these really nice, elegant systems. Uh, how many of you remember the term permaculture? Permaculture was a great term, kind of, they call it out of the hippies, uh, we call it in the 60s and 50s, uh, the kibbutz, it was this idea that you could have these closed systems where your food, your energy, your waste, everything is really kept in an area and, and synergistically utilized, and so there is no such thing as waste. In fact, one of the things we all know, we should all know, that by the year, let's say in another decade or two or three, the word waste out of agriculture is going to be a, a word of the past, a term that just has moved out, kind of like a, a harness and a horse and plow maybe, you know, we'll talk about it and say, wow, how did we throw away so many things in the past? But our ideas here for all these new systems, and yes, some of these systems are enormously efficient. They save 70, 80, 90 percent of the water use is not used. In other words, you're using maybe 10 percent to gain the same kind of production you might get on a square foot of ground. Um, but it still comes down to the fact that water is the driver uh, for every system in the agriculture that we have. You have to have water, it has to be clean, it has to be good, it has to be uh, uh, reliable. And as we look at where we're headed with water in our state, uh, thank God we had a good vote uh, in the elections to try and at least improve this dilapidated system that we have. But I'll be the first to say uh, the systems we have, they've served a purpose, they serve a purpose, both past and present and future, but there are a lot of new ways that we might look at uh, uh, creating and augmenting our supplies of water. Uh, there's a hurricane that hit uh, Bermuda just uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Bermuda's had, a, I, I believe it's a 600 year system of cistern water collection because they don't really have their own regular water source. They depend on water collection over the hundreds and hundreds of years they've been there as a community. And that hurricane, as much as, if it, co as, much as it caused a lot of havoc, it also gave them a tremendous amount of water to fill them up for yet another year uh, in terms of their water usage. Uh, we, we could learn from places all over the planet here in Southern California to put water in the walls of our houses, in cisterns underneath our, 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 our uh, houses. Um, and they're starting to actually show those kind of developments and mandate those development of cisterns, for example, in New Mexico, very dry places. Um, I'm a big believer in water collection in any way that you could have it. We uh, excel here in Southern California with putting uh, reclaimed water back into the aquifer. I've been using reclaimed water, tertiary treated water uh, from the sewer systems in my agricultural operations for over 25 years. It's some of the best water in the planet in terms of its clarity and purity, not clarity, but purity. It's clear, believe me, it's not lumpy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but at, at that point, it's really one step away from being potable again. And actually, they are starting to look at turning that water back potable again with one more step of uh, ultraviolet light or other kind of sterilization process to make sure it's got uh, as clean as it can be. These um, 
these systems that exist and are in being put in, we know that desalinization, I, I'm, I'm the one of the people that believes very, very strongly that we don't have a water problem. Uh, we have a salt problem. We've got a tremendous <laughs> amount of water all over the planet. Obviously, you look at it, it's a blue planet, but we have salt. So the minute we can link uh, really low cost renewable energy to desalination, and it might be desalination inland, it might be desalination on the oceans, these are the important things that we can start to do. And we start to recognize then that this abundance of water then be is not a limiting factor for us. In fact, so much so, there's a lot of water in the atmosphere. There's a, uh, you can pull water out of the atmosphere with new, uh, not new, they're old technology developed out of the military. They got tired of trucking in tanker loads of water to the, into the desert during, Gulf, to the, through, during the Gulf War, and they realized that was a huge vulnerability for the troops, trucking in tanker loads of potable water. So they were developing dehumidifiers that could pull water out of the atmosphere, uh, plugged into the wall or plugged into an energy system, and it's an enormous amount of water. And they were able to get it down, and they're still working at it, down as low as 20% relative humidity in the air could still bring water out of the atmosphere. I didn't believe these systems, but we actually got one of these and put it in our office, plugged it in the wall, and every day, little system less smaller than this le uh, lectern here would give us eight gallons of pure water. Pure water. It tasted horrible, but it was pure water. <laughs> it had a carbon filter and an and a, and a ultraviolet light in that, in that system, so it was potable drinking water. I'm a big believer in this uh, dilution is the solution uh, strategy where then that system blended together with some uh, brackish water or other kinds of water. You blend the pure water with, uh, for example, very high quality, uh, high mineral content ocean water and you blend it to just the right amount and that water could be both your drinking potable supply, it could also be your garden supply, it could be a small farm supply, it could be a big farm supply anywhere where you're near the ocean for example, uh, on the planet. And these new ways then of looking at water scarcity or water abundance, let's call it that, is I think what's ex exciting at a time and remarkable because these are not new technologies that have to be invented. They're already here. Uh, the last thing on water that I want to mention is on storage. I, I said enough about it, but if you think about these enormous amounts of water we had. There was a, a story, uh, it's not a story, it's a documentation out of the Chesapeake Bay that at flood stage in the 1700s, some boats record, record that they were four miles offshore and then an enormous plume of fresh water coming out of the Chesapeake Bay, four miles out to sea, they were filling up barrels of water, uh, potable water, drinking water, because that's how much water was coming out of that system. And it gave us, a, 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 some of us, a thought, why aren't we storing and saving fresh water out in the ocean, kind of like uh, a water balloon that you would have in your swimming pool. It, uh, wa fresh water is lighter than uh, seawater. You don't even need a bottom to it. You could store large amounts of water out in the ocean if you wanted to. What's happening on this area is we're just waiting for the engineers that would come up and say, yeah, we can do that. But I'll tell you what, there's a tremendous amount of naysayers that say, oh, that can't be done. We won't do that. Of course, a lot of those guys that say no, that can't be done are the guys that build dams on rivers, right? <laughs> so we're moving forward then with these different ways of looking uh, at our system. So if there's abundance of water that appears to be wide, quite a bit more water than we think on the planet, and I'd be the first to say that, there's a lot of energy on it that we have to harness, and we're in that process right now. I've had the chance of driving a hydrogen fuel cell car these last three years. I'm not in it right now, unfortunately. I had to turn it back in. It was part of a project down at UC Irvine. It was part of the uh, National Fuel Cell Research Center down there. The n hydrogen from that car that I was using was coming from the sewer system in Orange County where they're digesting human poop, getting the, the, the gas out of it, the biogas out of it, splitting off the hydrogen, and running fuel cells at the sanitation district down there to clean up the water and then put that water back into the aquifer in a recharge. Pretty neat stuff. And the, it was also bleeding off hydrogen enough to run a fleet of cars. And the, it, it's, it, it's true. They're available this year. That's why the program kind of stopped, because they're past the pilot stage. And now hydrogen cars are commercially available. And it is true. What comes out of the tailpipe is water. That's the only thing coming out of that car uh, as, a, as an exhaust thing. But we have wind farms. We have s solar farms. We have all kinds of systems. Just north here in Ventura County, the largest onion processing plant in the nation digests its onion peelings 
that they used to send to the dump takes the hydrogen and is running fuel cells to power that uh, processing plant up. It's, it's neat, it's happening, it's efficient, uh, it, it's improving. A lot of these technologies are, are on the maturing side, and yet we see that this is where we are going. As a farmer, I look at land a lot differently. I, I farm on about, oh God, uh, any, depending on the year, between 600, 800 to 1,000 acres, all rented land, all in Orange County. Um, I farm on vacant lots underneath the power lines. I look for anything that looks like the weeds are growing well. I'll, I'll ask the landlord if can I take it and borrow it until he, they're ready to do something else with it. Uh, we're looking at warehouses just like everybody else. Can we grow plants inside of warehouses? Of course you can. Can you be on the top of a building or in a parking lot? Of course you can. Can you uh, farm on an old airport? That's the old El Toro Marine Basin. That's us in between the, the runways there. That ground actually is amazing. It hadn't been farmed in 60 years, and it's just great ground. And it happened to be put, that airport was put on top of the prized lima bean field of James Irvine. He didn't want to give that piece of ground away, but they took it away from him for the military effort for World War II and sat there idled in for 60, 70 years. And it's great to have a shot at farming on it right now. Um, as we then are talking at this conference about urban systems, um, I have a hard time finding 40 acres of good ground in Orange County. Uh, you've all read about the 40 square miles of abandoned property in Detroit and the dozens of properties here in Los Angeles County that are government owned that are basically abandoned or not utilized, underutilized or not utilized. There's tremendous opportunity then for these, per for these properties to be repurposed. Uh, we've had a great opportunity to take um, uh, the former uh, military base there and find great pieces of ground, checking for contamination, checking for all the things you need to check for. But underneath, uh, it's amazing, underneath cement, underneath some of these properties, that the soil is just waiting to be reinvigorated, re-energized, put some life back into it and bring some productivity back. Uh, it, it's possible because it's happening not just with us, it's happening all over the world. Um, we're excited about that because there's uh, every, every new tool that you didn't have 30, 40, 60 years ago that you can bring to your uh, uh, rescue, if you will. If you don't have a water system, it's funny. People go, well, how do, you, how do you farm in an urban area? I look for a fire hydrant. You know, if I see the fire hydrant, there's my water source, and so I know I can get water eventually on a temporary basis. Uh, I know I could store water, I can clean up water, we can do a lot of different things. If we have some passive renewable energy that works within the system, we can actually plug that into some of the components of, that we farm with. And I, I, our, our focus right now is what is that toolbox in the area that you're farming, in the region that you'll be in. And it might be rural, it, it might be absolute uh, uh, farmland USA, or it might be in the middle of a city. Uh, I just came back from a, a conference in Lexington, Kentucky, and they're so focused. They've got the mayor plugged in, and this is as important as anything. The mayor here has been very engaged, uh, both the previous and the mayor right now, on the Food Policy Council. Keep up at that, because ultimately you can get stopped by your city council or your county or your neighbors if they don't understand what you're trying to accomplish or what you're wanting to do. Um, this renaissance of agriculture we're in right now is just as simple as that. It's an it's a amazing time of converging new thinking, new imagination, new technology that's emerging and, and maturing. And as we bring those together into these different kinds of systems, you also recognize here in our area, we have 25 something million people that live within an hour and a half of where we are sitting here. Um, Shame on us if we can't find that marketplace, because and market, marketing is as important as anything in, in, in terms of being a, a farmer these days. You have to have a good marketplace or someone that will help you with your market. And so uh, let me finish up and wrap up by saying we still are enormously alarmed, those of us that are working in the policy areas, whether it's global, whether it's regional, whether it's national, of how do we make sure we have capacity, how, much, how do we make sure we have the infrastructure that allows agriculture to exist in the first place. And this includes diagnostics for diseases and pests. This includes sanitary precautions that you have to take. It includes food safety standards that you hope you, you can put into place because the last thing you want to do is have someone collapse on you. 
because of the product that you grew. And there's just simple things that we all know about now much better than we did uh, a, a generation ago. Um, we're not going to have less challenges, but we have more ways to deal with the challenges up ahead of us. And that uh, uh, should be something that we should all be uh, thrilled about. We need new farmers. We need new, excited, smart, patient uh, folk that want to get involved with this food arena that know that feeding 9 billion plus people on the planet is, is an enormous task, it's an enormous challenge, but it's a very rewarding place to be. Um, and we want you to get excited about this future. It's, 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 we're, we're managing life systems and resources sustainably to create abundance, not look at plans for scarcity. This was the former military housing uh, unit at uh, Officers and Housing Tract at uh, the El Toro Marine Base, now the Orange County Great Park. Come down and visit us because we pulled, the houses were pulled off. We showed up and said, hey, that looks like a vacant lot. I see a few weeds. We pulled this concrete out. We pulled the rest of it out, took our test, plumbed it uh, with the fire hydrant at first. And then, uh, you know, the, the ground is beautiful, beautiful ground. And ultimately, it's, it's what we're all trying to do is create life, create abundance. And, and then more importantly, these choices allow us to have a great ability to live. So with that, uh, Robert, I think we're all set. And good luck, everybody, on the conference.